Uh, thank you. Wow. Thank you for showing up uh, for the last presentation of this conference. There, you're aware there is no prize giveaway this year, so I'm surprised you're still here. So thank you for uh, joining um, on a topic that I'm very passionate about from uh, lots of uh, lots of reasons. Uh, I think this is the year finally where I can uh, have all of my passions uh, all into kind of uh, one presentation. So. Um, yeah, uh, this is uh, using something that I came up with as a shorthand notation to replace a lot of the boring documentation notation that we've been kind of taught in school or adopted in different industries. Um, and hopefully because this is a nice lightweight uh, way of doing things, uh, it has uh, more potential in open source projects where you're already limited by the amount of time and resources that open source projects have, especially with overhead of project management and other things like this. So um, this has worked for us. No guarantee it'll work for you, uh, but I'm hoping that enough projects can be saved by adopting some of these things, especially larger, more legacy projects. Um, this is an intro talk, so there's a lot of things I'm not going to cover, but I uh, hope that you'll get inspired to kind of take some of the basics and extend them and join people on Discord and other groups to, to go forward. So just a little bit of background uh, about me. So I've been uh, coding since 1983 uh, on a Commodore 64 um, and then uh, the Amiga computers. So I'm familiar with A-Rex, a lot of uh, uh, old school uh, Motorola um, assembler, uh, the MOS uh, 6502, 6510 assembler. I like that. I basically learned those things in 1987 when I discovered that basic wasn't um, fast enough for making games as a, well, like most kids growing up, that was our uh, intro to computing is like, how do I make this thing uh, do games? And uh, how can I make games myself? Uh, I started consulting when I was still in high school, uh, got uh, pulled into a special program for, uh, for two students in grade 12, and um, the principal's uh, friend in government needed a automated, needed to digitize their um, office, so I was lucky enough to start consulting uh, in those days. Um, and lots of things happened in between. I got introduced to enterprise development as I went into the real world, and I really got disgruntled as to you know, how how much people get paid for paper pushing and doing really trivial development. It was kind of uh, not, not a very good discovery because I saw a lot of people getting paid for doing a lot of um, lazy development and uh, things like that. Anyway, enough about my opinion. Um, in uh, 2005, I really started to see uh, things kind of falling apart with the uh, uh, ex uh, embrace, extend, extinguish with Microsoft practices and the bomber years. Um, and in 2005, I started to see um, how open source projects were really driven by community and how much healthier it is for society and everyone involved. And uh, that ended up uh, with me being part of the alt.net movement, which was uh, the Microsoft community's attempt to grow an open source uh, community themselves uh, and projects and support them instead of waiting for uh, the ivory tower to spit out frameworks for them to use, etc. So that was a, um, my first introduction, just to just to really feel how um, how different those two worlds were. And in so doing, I en ended up getting introduced to Git, which introduced me to really using Linux all the time. I started using Linux kind of like for kind of media servers, like maybe I had an Ubuntu thing, but it was always like an old box. Uh, my day to day job required me to. Um, kind of uh, interface with the evil empire that uh, was in Redmond. So um, anyway, uh, it, it definitely staying there allowed me to really feel kind of the backwards ways of things that, you know, how things were going. And, um, and then in uh, 2008, through the connections through that kind of community, I really under started to understand um, information systems for what they were and some of the uh, some of the patterns that we were employing, some of the things that looked easy. And um, around 2008, 2010, a lot of the Ruby on Rails kind of Rails knew these really uh, bad shortcuts that were taken to, to build something very quickly um, and then really suffer in the long term. I, I find this is also true of open source. So there's some common things that um, drive regular projects 
um, and, and open source projects. And then there's a lot of things that are different. I'm already kind of alluded to like the amount of time that we have in open source. We have, we're really working with limited resources a lot of times. So it's really um, imperative to be um, you know, more uh, judicial with how, what we uh, invite to these projects because they can be very energy draining and time draining. Uh, so just some background as to like what I was using and then in 2015 I decided to see if this was actually true and I actually did find some better ways to do things I, I can maybe have a whole company that just does things like this and then maybe if field of dreams if you build it they will come uh, a lot of people did join the company and never left and really like working this way so I'm hoping to share this with you so that if you do like it there's definitely kind of a red pill from the matrix uh, moment where like oh I don't want to do things uh, any other way. I certainly um, can't go back to working on projects in a, in a different way. Um, and in 2018 I had a post about this methodology go viral on, um, on Hacker News um, which started to kind of really take off and people started to ask me about, about these things and, and uh, right now it's kind of at the point where really large corporations are asking me um, uh, Thunderbird projects asking me about this. A lot of open source things are asking about ways of doing this. So it's we'll see how far that goes. I haven't had enough uh, experience in really large open source uh, projects adopting this, but it certainly has uh, helped traditional projects. I'm hoping that a lot of this can actually help uh, the open source community. So what are some of these issues that we have in open source? Well, we have certainly uh, this uh, problem where, where projects that are long in the tooth kind of grow in complexity, it really becomes hard for people to start to contribute to those. There's just, it just becomes too much of a, um, a complex system with uh, too many side effects if you make any changes. Um, and that's true also not just in open source, I think it's just a general statement about most software projects. And for this reason, of course, the onboarding, if you're, if you're wanting to get technical uh, input and contribution to these projects, you're gonna have a harder time getting people to get up to speed to contribute. You know, you might start with bug fixes, et cetera, but when it comes to actually adding a feature and doing something core inside the project, it becomes harder and harder the further you go along. Um, so one of the things with open source projects, especially smaller ones or medium sized ones is that you don't have the budget or or place for things like project managers and all these things that uh, people try to throw in from the agile uh, approach or any other approaches. Uh, open source generally doesn't see um, a lot of room for those types of rules. Um, so we also see that systems are lossy, like the way they treat data. Um, schema migrations between versions can be quite difficult. I worked at Active State where we did um, Cloud Foundry uh, upstream, took upstream Cloud Foundry and made a product based on it, basically removing the VMs and replacing them with Docker containers. So our project was kind of built on top of Cloud Foundry um, and that's open source. Uh, but we couldn't even migrate from certain versions to other versions. It was cheaper to backport features to an older version the client had than to actually migrate the client to a newer version. That's how scary some of this data management can be. So that's one of the things when I started my company, I wanted none of these things to happen. And so that was a, that was a big problem. And of course, because a lot of open source projects are kind of uh, nerdy uh, projects that we built uh, for ourselves, a lot of times the usability, the UX aspect, isn't uh, really looked at. And uh, with, with some notable ex exceptions, of course, we have uh, elementary OS and um, certainly the most recent uh, Thunderbird effort has been all about uh, usability. So there's definitely good shifts in open source towards looking at usability and UX and you know, user experience, developer experience, etc. Even sysadmin experience or DevOps or whatever, right? So we're getting better th uh, in that area, but a lot of projects are just simply um, too technical um, or just have that technical perspective on how things should be done. Um, documentation is something that's kind of been seen as evil, um, but we've, in at least the Linux community, have tried to have, um, you know, the, the man pages and the, and the help files, the info files, and all those kinds of things. So um, the open source community should be a little bit more friendly towards open source, but we, uh, sorry, the documentation in open source, but we, we certainly don't have, I, I don't feel like there's a very good standard besides the basic readme of, you know, getting up to s speed in terms of running it, but, and, and maybe there's some superficial way of talking about the um, idea of how it works. 
but there's really no um, uh, no real explanation of the inner workings of a project. Maybe you might look at some unit tests or something like that if it's provided, uh, but there's kind of no standard way of doing that. So we've kind of come up with a standard notation for this, which hopefully can be adopted. But definitely the readme files, it's kind of scattered. Like if you go up, take a random open source project, it, it's all different for every project, I feel, anyway. Um, so suboptimal testing, a lot of times we have many different opinions on testing. Um, so we've standardized to just unit tests and integration tests are just unit tests of specific instruments we put in to show how all of the things work together from the perspective of integration test. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, estimates are next to impossible. Like you're working with a lot of contributors of varying backgrounds and experience levels, et cetera. So it's almost next to impossible to do that. So we've also quantified the size of projects to really be focused on things like amount of state transitions and amount of uh, projections from state that you get. And those seem to be really good units of work. And if we see that in open source, we can um, get a lot more information from that. Um, and then, so yeah, there a lot of them are, are kind of disorganized and ad hoc in general. So uh, especially once things are forked and there's a different, you know, uh, motivation in terms of how something's supposed to be built, you'll see a lot of uh, things that are legacy versus the new way of approaching things can be all over the place. So as I said, I kind of, this is a listing of like what I just said. So, um, you know, so. Uh, we, we try to use multiple models for keeping the uh, efforts reasonable. So a lot of times the complexity is because we try to uh, base things. And, and let me just add one more caveat. Um, open source is going everywhere. And I'm not talking about kernel modules here doing something very uh, technical or scientific. I'm talking about everything out there like Next Cloud, CRMs, kind of what's replacing all of the, like the uh, user-facing software out there. Like if I'm going to make an open source point of sale system, or I'm going to make a general platform for insurance companies so that we can um, all have, you know, lower insurance uh, premiums all over the world. I'm talking about everyday kind of software for, every, like for, for that type of uh, perspective. But it can also be used in some more technical things. That's where you have to kind of um, see exactly how this would fit into that. Uh, but the first point is using uh, multiple models really does allow for keeping the uh, complexity low and uh, moving features um, forward without incurring this hockey stick curve of complexity. So it's kind of it goes against the grain because all we've been taught is how we should normalize data. We should have only one user table and use that ID and, and things like that. That's actually not you've heard about don't repeat yourself kind of falling out of favor recently well that goes for data too um i would rather repeat uh information um on disk multiple times to support multiple models the key trick is you know it's not just about event modeling but it's also about keeping all information that's coming into the system and if you capture input and write that down on disk that can be your tiebreaker when you have two competing models saying i'm right or i'm right um, you always go back to what was the information when it entered the system. That's how we resolve these um, conflicts between multiple models. And so that allows us to continue to use many, many models, uh, many, many same pieces of data being repeated and maybe changed slightly for different purposes. So let's say you're doing a CRM website. You can have one, uh, one of the web pages uh, use a specific user table that has uh, full names as one field with first name, last name. Another one that's used on the registration part that would actually split those two. So you can have both models side by side. But certainly when someone's developing and working on one of those screens, they don't want to have to walk on eggshells and worry about how that original registration screen is still working. Right? So that's, that's the level of decoupling that we need is so, so that contributors to open source projects can work um, in enough autonomy not to step on each other's toes. And uh, that's what the multiple models uh, support. Uh, we need to establish a cadence and patterns for feature development. So I want to be able to go into a open source project and really look at the previous features that were developed and follow a thread of exactly how that was done. I almost want to copy paste what that other person did for the next feature. I shouldn't have to really um, have to figure things out and have every new feature be a brand new puzzle for me to solve. I want to have some patterns that are established. And, um, and then conventions, of course, if you have kind of a good way of working, you reduce all that management um, overhead. Do we need a lot of code reviews? Do we need a lot of all these other things? 
to continue. If we have more conventions, the system will take care of itself rather than having to require person effort on it. And I think that goes a long way in, op in open source. Um, so lose no data, back to the original point of supporting uh, multiple models. Um, one of the best things that I've discovered is that as soon as data enters a system, if you're using systems thinking and you put a box around what you're responsible for and you take note of when information enters the system and just write down that fact and what that information is, you can rely on that to help you um, anywhere that information will be used eventually, even if it's through automated processes, etc. And there's a pattern here that will show that allows you to track that. Um, where that information will eventually um, end up. But the key is that's your tiebreaker for any of these issues. So losing no data is a, a really good default. And I, I put that lose no data there for a reason is because the default approach is to have a database underneath where you're deleting rows and you're updating rows. Well, what was the old data in those rows? Um, do you have a good backup system? That's not online and available to you. It's not really easy to, um, to see. And especially in open source, if you have a, a pivot in terms of what the project's going for, the data you deleted before might actually have been very helpful for the feature you want in the following year. But guess what? The default approach makes you delete that data. And so we don't want to do that by default. We have plenty of disk space. We have compression. We have a lot of things that make this a non-issue, right? But, and, but we're still like thinking in the 1960s, disk is very expensive kind of thinking. That's what we get taught in school. Um, so it's time to kind of uh, relax those rules a bit and, and take advantage of having um, a whole breadcrumb trail of how we got somewhere in our system and actually helps a lot of ways. Um, so, of course, uh, user experience, uh, really good to kind of have that feeling of, I can see the user using this. I'm not just looking at a whole bunch of UML tables with some lines and boxes and kind of get confused. I actually want to see what the wireframe would be and I want to see some example data of someone using that, like a storyboard for a movie. I want to really see what's going on. And that's lets, lets people to, you know, really understand what's going on. Um, so uh, the other thing is we need to use a single document. How many times have we seen uh, wiki pages and forums and comments and other documents all fall out of sync and you have about, you know, once a project gets large, you might have, you know, 50 documents, 50 different wiki pages and then no one knows where to go look for information. You kind of always have to look at, oh, last edited when. You have to correlate that back when that initial ticket was written and all that. There's this is actually quite a big point. I actually discussed this with uh, Linus Torvalds in 2018 when he was in Vancouver, where I was basically asking, why don't we have the practice of forum discussions, the state of them, actually be committed next to the repository for the same project so that you can correlate when something was posted on a forum with exactly when a code change occurred. Because, I don't know, I, I remember a whole bunch of ticketing systems that I've used in the past, Redmine, all sorts of different things. And they're always sitting to the side of the actual project. And then once that fell, fell out of favor and it was hard to import into a new issue tracker or whatever, all this information lived in different places. So I think it's mostly just information and text and conversation. These are very simple things. Very, like in the grand scheme of things, they take up very little space, maybe with like screenshots. If you put screenshots in, okay, that's going to be a little bit more to store. But... Nothing horrendous, right? Maybe if you're doing, uh, you know, video clips of uh, showing a, a, a thing, but you can still solve that another way by storing a URL to some shared uh, uh, resource. But anyway, the idea is that you shouldn't have to go look at 50 different places to understand what's going on. That's, that's a big problem with a lot of these projects. Um, and then, of course, specification by example uh, in the types of tests. I, as I said, this is um, how we solve that testing problem of having things. We, we, we decided to not bother with doing the uh, automated UI tests, but it was just underneath. And that's been enough for, for that. And I think you can get lost with a lot of the kind of, I'm going to use uh, back in the day, those uh, Watin for .NET, Watir for Ruby, um, Selenium, you know, all these frameworks. They try to automate the UI. That's great and all, but I think as a point of diminishing returns, I think we really want a really good, um, dependable, system that maintains state and uh, and we can sort of uh, uh, call it a loss on some of the UI stuff and I think for us it's worked quite well and of course simplifying the number of patterns we simplified on we just want to we just want to treat state changes and views of state as the two core patterns and we kind of tie that back to how we never lose data 
and we always go back to when the data entered the system as kind of being the source of truth for these two patterns. And that's usually referred to as event sourcing, although this idea has been around in accounting for thousands of years. It's how accountants and most um, information systems before computers worked, they all worked off of these ledgers of like who traded what with what company, if you did fur trading back in the day or whatever. Um, so, you know, going back to those kinds of uh, patterns for information systems has been very, uh, very good for simplification, right? Simplicity is so hard uh, to get at, and this is my effort to keep things as simple as possible. So what is this blueprint? So we have this type of diagram. I haven't labeled it or anything, but it's got a couple of uh, key pieces that address um, some of the points that we went over just now. Uh, so you'll notice that it moves from left to right. There's an implicit timeline. We use example data in this. There's screens at the top, etc. So let's go through them. So we kind of identify subsystems that we may have. We might have an authentication system with maybe an inventory system underneath. And as information enters the system, remember I talked about that border, when information comes into the system, we write that down in those yellow boxes at the bottom. And which swim lane they exist in tells you which subsystem, logically, I mean, they don't have to be deployed as separate Docker containers or anything. They may if you want, but it has no opinion on implementation, right? This has no opinion on implementation. It's just about talking about what we do with the information in the system so that someone has an idea very quickly about what the system does, where they can find stuff. So that's kind of like where the subsystems may be. You can even... It's up to you, really, um, how you want to organize that, how granular it is. A lot of times, we only have one system, so we only have one swim lane there for a lot of these systems, which is fine. Um, you can also use these swim lanes to talk about external integrations. If you're using a CRM or something that has a payment uh, integrator like Stripe, you can kind of have a separate swim lane for all those interactions with, that, with each specific uh, type of external system, so that when someone looks at this schematic of the system, they know exactly at what points in each workflow, you're going to be talking to Stripe or talking to some other external system, right? So it's, a, it's kind of like musical notes. Once you get a lot of these integrations, you can see as you go across which notes on the piano are being hit as we do all of that. So it's kind of user-friendly way of introducing someone that's technical or non-technical to see just how information travels in the system. So same with uh, users. So if we have an administrator that can set up some accounts, et cetera, and then we have the actual users using something, we can have many of these. Usually one or two examples per different rule that the system supports. And uh, this is the UI, the UX part. So you can always tie it back to, you know, what, what is the person actually seeing on the screen? When we have this open source CRM and we're at this particular workflow and we're looking at this screen, does it make sense now when they hit this uh, save button where that goes? and what the subsequent things are happening, right? So, and then there's the state. So the blue and green boxes basically say, blue, the blue box says, uh, some information is about to enter the system. This is your chance to validate it. If they malform the email, you can reject it. But if it passes, it goes in and gets stored as that little yellow box. And then we keep moving on, right? So this is that responsible part of, I'm just gonna capture what entered the system right now. And later on, the green box, they can listen to any number of these yellow boxes. And they're basically like your left fold in functional programming. It's like, given that we have a shopping cart and someone added an item, removed an item, added three more items, well, what, what's in there right now? I have the history of what the person did in, with that particular shopping session. You're on Amazon adding, removing, right? It's like, oh, I added this to my basket, but then I kept browsing and actually I can buy this kit that includes that thing. So I'm gonna like take that out Right. This is the typical kind of shopping basket example. It's a canonical example for this, but it works for a lot of other things. So the green boxes are kind of like your fold um, of that state. And in automation, a lot of the stuff is just back end, which has no UI. But um, you still want to basically take a look and see. And a good example is we had a, uh, we had a project for uh, Plenty of Fish where it really looked you know, from a UX perspective, very simple. Send and receive a message, you know, but it's a public platform, and uh, you obviously need to do a lot in terms of filtering for spam and all sorts of nasty things. So it's, you know, well, on the, on the wireframes, it looks pretty simple. You got one user sending a message and another user receiving a message. Well, on the back end, there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen. You have to look for swear words, you have to look for character substitutions, so dollar signs and S's can be, you know, uh, coerced back to what they're, intention was. Um, so it ended up being like 12 or 14 steps. 
but it was really good to provide this uh, to them so that they understood, you know, to send a message, it's this complexity. And I don't have to go into the nitty gritty details of a UML diagram with, class, with classes and method names. I can just tell them how many times we had to transform the information to really understand that that message was clean, right? And that was a really good unit of work for them to understand just how large that effort was. So I think when you're talking about uh, in an open source perspective, if you, if you have a bunch of contributors, this is a good way to coordinate you know, one piece of functionality that you might actually want to do in parallel with a bunch of other people, right? And we call these slices because they give us a really good contract on when, when a part of like a state transition has been finished and what the preconditions are and what the post conditions are based in regular natural language. But that actually gives you a really good technical specification because I'm allowed to let the contributor do whatever they need to do to make that blue box happen and that screen. I don't have to be very judgmental. I don't have to do a lot of um, code reviews and things like that. I can be quite permissive because this, the acceptance criteria is a lot simpler now. It's I got to make sure that the state of the system can support whatever I have on this diagram later on, right? And in order for me to get my work done, I have the preconditions of, of everything that I have beforehand at my disposal to accomplish that. So it becomes a very simple set of rules to, uh, to do that. And same with, um, uh, same with the green box. And then so we do a pitchfork of features. So our sort of idea of ideal history is making sure that each of those slices is represented by one effort. And each slice goes all the way up to the UI, by the way, through any logic and all the way to the state. So everything in between, it's got like a full stack developer kind of look, right? So you know that you moved on the timeline from this point to this point, and there's nothing else left to go and fix up later. Like it's a done is done kind of mark. And that makes it quite good. So each of those efforts of those slices can be there. And they don't have to be done in any particular order. Like we usually have a lot of dummy screens where you press buttons and nothing's happening underneath, but you get to the core part. And you kind of want that because when you start a project, you want to get to the really meaty kind of interesting features immediately. You want to make sure that the people that are going to use it can exercise that and, and see that it's good. You can fill in, you can backfill the boring stuff like the login, right, and the reports or rating system or whatever. So that's kind of how we do things. So you know, different people can be working on these things at different times. Um, it looks like, oh, this is like the uh, big features that never get integrated. Well, that's not true. Um, we actually do integrate them all along in a separate branch just to test them out. Things like menu items and the UI um, or other common components, <clears throat> we don't uh, merge those in, we cherry pick them so that it simplifies all the merging later. Um, gets quite good at understanding what you cherry picked from other places, but you don't need to have those explicit links that tie two features together. So uh, cherry picking is best used in, in, that, in that place. So then this is your um, typical release candidate like you would have in the Linux kernel. So a lot of this is very synonymous with what you'll find at the Linux kernel um, source code management. It's actually very applicable to everyday open source things and like regular projects. So as these features get finished, let's see these last three features are actually finished. We, we merge them to this RC branch. You know, it could be different times. I mean, one of them could be really short and we could already have one ready there to, to be done and like ship. And so it's really important in open source where, you know, there's many reasons to want to build something at any point in time and release it and use it. So at this point, any features that are complete, you can mix and match. And more importantly, you can, if something unforeseen happens, you can leave one out. A lot of times reverting something that's released or, or composing something, if you don't have a discipline like this, it's harder to take out a feature. And you start to put in if statements and feature flags and configurations, which really adds to the complexity. We don't want to add that complexity. We want this composability of the actual work. And we also don't really squash any of these things. I actually want accountability, not readability. If I actually want the squashed version of any of these features, I can just do a log with a diff to get a patch from the first commit to the last. I have the squashed version at any point. There's no reason to throw out the history of what someone did in terms of like getting that to work, right? With other strategies, it's a little bit more complex, especially trunk-based development and things like that because you are messing up what everyone else is looking at. So that's why it doesn't work there. But in this case, I actually do want to see, you know, how someone was struggling with a feature. It's actually good information. I don't want that to get covered up because they're ashamed of their work and have to squash it and 
oh, uh, actually, I'll just do this little thing, right? I, and then, well, why did it take you two weeks, <laughs> right? So we kind of want that. Um, I think it's a little more transparency to how things go. And then, you know, we just rinse, repeat. We do this over and over again. And the key point is, what makes it really composable is these, is these start points. So as you'll see a lot of things like Git flow and all these other things. Um, they rarely m show how important it is to have a common starting point so that everyone that's doing the next round of effort is actually on level ground. They're not kind of tripping each other up. They're still integrating to see like, oh, am I doing something that's really gonna like do something nasty to someone else, right? And uh, all of these uh, uh, merges that we have here, um, if we use re, re re and git, it'll remember our conflict resolutions. And so when we actually do the final kind of merge here to release candidate, um, git will know how those conflicts were resol resolved, most anyway. Um, and this is really, um, once you do everything else I said, um, it's quite modular. So we actually don't have um, any conflict resolution issues. We, the, I mean, long gone are my days of like a whole afternoon of dealing with merge conflict resolutions. I don't want to ever go back there. But having this idea of you know having really good modular unit of work um, inside the efforts really takes away all of these other things, um, all these other downhill problems that, that we experience. So uh, maybe I can go to some examples here. Kind of a, I have an open source project that I'm doing for like having this online, so it's in Git. You can take a look at it on my GitHub page. Um, and sort of coming up with like a standard, let me just see if I can, I'm afraid of mirroring this, uh, <laughs> this display because of the issues with the resolution of this projector, but let me see if I can, let me just see, escape that. That's not showing anything. Okay, let me, uh, let me grab that on my screen and get it set up. It's kind of hard to work with this monitor set up, but. Ah, there it is. Okay. One more try. Okay, so. Here's kind of uh, and this guy. Okay, wrong resolution. Everything's everywhere now. <laughs> Is that out of the way? All right. So here's an example of like how we have the UI sitting here and how we mark some of the slices being done or not. And I'd like to color code some of the information coming in, etc. So if someone's coming into this project, let's say this is a this is a billing system that's open source, and so there's a some complexity in setting up effective dates for taxes and things like that. So I have kind of everything. Um, I'm going to try to get a little bit more real estate here. Because that is a really bad resolution. <laughs> uh, yeah, hopefully that people can. Can you see that? OK. Yeah. Yeah, OK. I want to make sure we have some time for uh, questions and answers. So up here, if you zoom out, you can always see there's com company management. This is where we input the company info. And then here we go with the um, taxes where it can have some complexity in terms of uh, adding effective dates for when the tax rate changes and then the f eventually when a tax has been uh, eliminated. And we actually did have some taxes eliminated in Canada <laughs> once upon a time. So that is a, believe me, that is a use case in some governments. <laughs> Usually they only add taxes, I know, or increase them. So there's no minus button on the tax rate. But um, yeah, <laughs> uh, in, in some cases it does work. So you can see this is the management uh, swim lane for the manager at the top. And uh, that's where you can get the walkthrough of exactly what's going on. And if I zoom out, oh, that's way too much. Um, you can see that uh, the different subs, we only have one subsystem here. But um, right now I'm experimenting with Draw.io and Excaladraw as uh, kind of the readme replacement. Remember I talked about how we need something better than readme replacement? So we're kind of playing with this being the readme so that anyone goes in uh, to a project in the root folder instead of a dot readme, you're going to have a, an event model uh, to show here's how, if you were to run this project, the screens that different people could see with some example data, right? And of course, it's not all just linear. There are some like what if scenarios in terms of like, what if I put this tax rate in or what if, what if I put in the wrong information? How do I show validation? 
We usually put those uh, specifications down here. So like one of these little blue boxes, it may have uh, about like maybe 10 unit tests to show different scenarios of like, oh, if I put a tax rate of zero, that's not allowed or a negative tax rate, or if I wanna do, uh, or if I have some previous tax rate set, this one's invalid because you already ended the tax rate. You can't have an effective date that's later than the end date for the taxation uh, policy. So you can do your business rules kind of exploded down here, but you really want the happy path up there to so, sort of when someone opens up a project, they're not just staring at code and a short readme file about like how to get the project running. They actually want to know how this thing works, what information it's storing and at what point is that information stored? When does it integrate with other systems, right? How does the system work? So all of the code in here uh, in this project I'm going to be putting links into, like, into the blue boxes at the bottom so that you get the Git code snippet that, where that's implemented. Like it's literally, remember in the, I mean, some of you are old enough to remember really old TVs with vacuum tubes where you took the back of the TV off and there was a schematic of exactly how the TV worked and you could follow the line to take different vacuum tubes in and out when they were broken. Like we don't do that anymore and we don't do that for software, which is crazy. So that's a little bit more of like making software projects a little bit more like engineering, like taking all the things we learned about engineering and having good documentation. That's not too expensive. Like this is a pretty trivial, like childish almost looking diagram. It doesn't take a lot. It's not a impressive looking UML thing that's gonna take you forever to read because it's got a box for every class and a line for every method call, right? We don't care about the employment. Remember that autonomy part? Like, Develop that blue box however you want. Um, you're free to do that, as long as I know that the state has moved one step forward. That's a good deal between the people that want features and the people implementing features. We get in trouble when we let the people that want features dabble in the details and kind of say, well, how are you doing that, right? <laughs> we also have the opposite problem when we get wishy-washy requirements and the developers are frustrated because like, well, you don't tell me how this thing's supposed to work or what you really want, right? So this kind of solves it from both problems. It's kind of like the place where we found the most common ground between people that want features and the people that are going to implement features. And I think it can go a long way to help um, open source projects. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll open it up to uh, uh, questions and answers. This is just an intro talk. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of details that are fun to explore and that if you get to it yourself, you're going to uh, you know, get uh, get some really interesting insights and, and uh, yeah, good, also good community um, around all this. Um, oops. Yeah, so I, I called it event modeling because people said, you don't have a name for this, <laughs> right? We have the best practices of specification by example. We have best practices from UX. We have best practices from a few other things, but all of it together kind of became its own thing. And that's why that blog post was so popular and they, you know, in 2018, they kind of said, well, you can't call it just this thing, so we called it event modeling. So if you Google it, that's all I've been calling it, so you should find a ton of info on it. Um, and uh, we have a Discord group where people just do this. Uh, there's also, like, besides using regular Canvas drawing, things like uh, Draw.io or Excaladraw or Miro in most enterprises, um, there's people that are making their own products for this. There's about six or seven now uh, companies that make an event modeling Canvas. And I'm uh, playing around with an open source one that just does, like it doesn't use the canvas in HTML, but it does, you can, you know, it's kind of like a spreadsheet. So it's already opinionated where things go. So I'm experimenting with just using divs in HTML and like vanilla JS, vanilla HTML. There's so much stuff in regular JavaScript now on the front end that you can do this and drag and drop these things and connect them with arrows just with just plain JavaScript. So. Um, if you're interested, there's also a, a GitHub project on that that I'm working on, which is kind of a good way to experiment, you know, with these types of diagrams, what you can do with uh, divs and doing uh, transparency and animations and stuff. So I'll open up to the to questions now because I think I, I went a little long. It's a, <laughs> yeah, yes. I was just wondering if you looked at Mermaid.js. Yes. No, no, um, a lot of them are good. Um, I think one of the issues with storyboards and usability parts is that are horizontal. A lot of um, uh, technical document, like diagrams are vertical. Um, so we, I had some issue, also plant UML. I tried uh, extending that. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna die on that hill. Uh, if people wanna try it, that's fine. 
I'm kind of saying uh, if there is a standard for encoding this, it, I really don't care what it is because it's so easy to see what each thing does. And the example data, you have property types. If you're doing strongly typed systems, you can embed all that in all those um, different colored boxes. And it can be quite a detailed spec if you need it to be. Um, and so, yeah, there's just a few conventions. Remember, I want it to be very simple. So it's just very few conventions to, to go ahead and do this. But really what your goal is to be able to have a, a documentation or a document style that can walk someone through the essence of the project and also be deep enough to actually serve as requirements. And then you can go back to that and say, are these things done or not? And then all of a sudden your pull requests become things that don't have a lot of merge conflicts. You really start to see that this organization is helping you. Like, uh, we need to do some system design. I think that we've been led to believe that all we have is really complex UML at our disposal, and that's not true. So you know, if we do something like this, right, I, maybe you do something else, but I hope this kind of opens your mind to, you know, seeing how you can help open source projects kind of do that, and especially for legacy, because if an open source project is so complex that it's just not worth rewriting, at least you can look at, look at it through the empirical lens of, okay, I understand the state transitions. I can make an event model for something I don't understand by not really caring about what's in the blue or green box, but I know what's on the screens, and I know what's in the database, and now I know that I can put a sidecar to extend something. I can put an Nginx rerouting for this one page, and I'm just gonna redo that one. And now you got the project back alive again, right? That's what's gonna save a lot of these projects, right? Like, let, treat it like a black box. Like, if it's still working, but it's just too messy, that's okay. Know how to like treat it empirically to understand the state transitions, right? Fred Brooks said, you know, give me all the diagrams. I will continue to be kind of uh, confused, but show me the actual data, the state of the system, and I'll know exactly what your system does, right? And that was said in the 60s. So he's, uh, he's quite, a, quite a good person to, to follow. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago, but um, has contributed a lot to, uh, to that, including the Mythical Man Month, very famous book. So um, a lot of this is inspired from um, studying what he did. Any other questions? How would you apply this to uh, planning out a brand new system? Oh, so um, it's interesting. So the this basic kind of uh, diagram, you can start either from the user, user, I've done it two ways most of the time. Um, conceptually, you can start with what things happened in the system. What information do I think I'm gonna capture as a state transition, such as I'm doing a uh, insurance uh, system. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna to have to do a insurance payout. Well, I'm for sure one of these yellow boxes is gonna be paid out insurance, right? And I'm gonna to have to think about, oh, that's gonna to be to this client, etc. So I'm going to brainstorm all the possible events that can happen in the system and grow it from that. But then I can start to put them in chronological order, kind of think about, is that going to work? Do I have all the information I need? The other thing that provides this thing co called information completeness. So when you're done thinking, brainstorming, and you have some rudimentary UI on, on top of it, you can start to trace this, just like a schematic on the TV. Make sure everything's connected. Am I making up the fact that I already have the email for this user? Right? Like, uh, that's, I mean, that is the problem with a lot of uh, software, is that it's incomplete requirements. And no one actually takes the time, they just think that it's thrown in the backlog of some like agile methodology and get to it later. That's horrible. <laughs> that's a bomb waiting to go off three months in. Right? We don't want to work that way. We want to take you know, the necessary 15 minutes to save two weeks of headaches um, three months in. Right? And uh, there's nothing magic about open source. They, they still have to be managed, and they still have to you know, not set up, be set up for disappointment like we do in other private um, areas, so, you know, non-public projects. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, you talked about replacing the readme. Like, so would you have like, an event model at the top level and then like sub-event model for like, any or is it? We've uh, never really, there's only been a couple of cases where there needed to be sub-event models, uh, and it's simply because the tool that we chose, like Miro, um, it just got too complex. Um, one of the largest systems I worked on was um, a company called Line Data, and they were basically the uh, platform for trading uh, for the top Fortune 50. So it was responsible for about 5 to 10% of the world's 
trading traffic in stocks and bonds. No pressure, right? <laughs> we, we did this and some of those yellow boxes at 300 properties, like a New York Stock Exchange standard order is like 300 fields, it's insane. But we had to do this information completeness and to be able to trace everything. Um, and there was just so much data on there that the, the Miro board, which is just an, uh, in your browser, Canvas in your browser, would just be too slow. So we ended up having three of them <laughs> just because it was so much. I mean, like it, wasn't, it wasn't trivial. I'm talking about one or two swim lanes. They had 25 at least, at least. <laughs> yeah. But they really needed that schematic because they were, they needed to re, uh, they're basically rewriting a Windows uh, desktop software to be modern, like and the, their competitors were starting to do it. And once you lose one, the Reebok, Procter Gamble, they all start to switch platforms. You're dead in the water very quickly if someone's already switched. So they were on their like second or third rewrite and they called me into Boston to fly in to help them do this and it saved their bacon. So the second, like we did a whole workshop using this uh, for two or three days. Second, beginning of the second day, we found the most misunderstood part, which was they had like the trades are so large they're they're done in waves, not they're not just baskets of different securities, but they're so large that they affect the market price. So they have to be done in wave acquisitions, and so there's a lot of complexity in this, and you have to kind of track where you are and like how you're going to pull the cord if things are going the wrong way in the market and all that sort of stuff. It was that um, monitoring screen that was the culprit, and going through this and doing a lot of those um, specifications, all those iterations from one of these green boxes was kind of the the, the key point they kept missing, because they never went through to what information is available and all that. Once they did that, they're they're good. The project finished properly. So in that example with the business software that was capturing events at the top level for that application, or the, no, that's internal. Anytime you have a state change, these things represent any kind of information captured. Um, in and out of the system. You can use this to kind of abstract what you understand for like a third party as well. So to you, it's like uh, Stripe process my payment. So what information do you think they have? Obviously you don't know their implementation, but you know what's important to you in your confirmation message back and you put that as a yellow sticker. Does that make sense for, well, what do you mean by top level? <laughs> Maybe you can clarify, but. Oh, diagram. yeah. And it had some things that seemed like. I'm going to try to go back to that. So I had some things that were. I don't have one swim lane here right now. For, for, there's only one system right now. So there's no two swim lanes for the events down below. Uh, I do have two users. There's some coming. Ah, I have that stupid layers box in the way. This resolution change is really not good. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so this is the actual um, user that's set up because that's the, the top swim lane for the users. That's the admin that's setting up the company tax info and all that. But the actual contractors that are marking their hours, et cetera, that's a separate like UI swim lane. That's where they're doing, they have different screens and that's where they're uh, putting that. I can zoom in maybe, maybe. <laughs> With this resolution, I'm not sure. Right, yeah. Right, so pick clients, the type of work. And the reason I'm making this is because no accounting or like um, uh, management software for, for consultancies has fixed costs. Like we do the, all of this on fixed costs. So in terms of rewarding people for contributing PRs, you can be totally non-biased uh, about who's doing the work because you can have a junior person that takes two or three weeks to get one pull request for one of these pieces versus someone that's incredibly skilled that does it in two to three hours or a day. Um, the reward should be the same. You shouldn't care if they're black, white, woman, man. So it takes up all these subjectivity is gone and you can just look at the value delivered. So that's one of the things that I really like about this is because uh, we have none of this management overhead, no HR department to deal with this stuff. It's like we only have seniority based hiring because of this. It's, it really simplifies things. If someone's slow, they self-select out. Or if they're not motivated, they, they're just not going to get paid. And I, just, I have to tell them, I'm sorry, the client will not pay for work that's not there. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. We obviously try to support them and, and do that. And part of it is through this cadence so that if you go into a project, you're really not looking 
at solving a brand new puzzle each time. You know, when we hire people, we're basically telling them, just look at what the previous feature, how it was implemented, because it's all in one line of thought. You can directly copy how that person did it and switch all the pieces. And if it does what it's supposed to at the end of that, perfect. We actually want that copy paste, but from our own stuff, not random things from the internet, right? So yeah, that's, that's kind of worked. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if you're referring to this for in the top yeah. swim lanes, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of like different actors, human actors, how they interact with the system. They're, they're kind of explained there. And I try to co uh, color code some of, the some of the things. So if I have like a, a bunch of fields that are gonna be submitted, I try to color them in blue, meaning those are gonna go through the blue box. And like if I have some things that have come out because of the green box, I color those things on the screen, say that's dynamic data, that's actually coming from that last query, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. We've been doing this for uh, close to nine years now and it's been incredibly successful on very small and very large projects. Uh, Saskatchewan government is using this, uh, one of the largest um, insurance company, sorry, uh, real estate company in Australia is doing, is rolling this out across 90 teams to coordinate their stuff. So it's, it's become very lightweight, easy to adopt. And um, hopefully, you know, you, you see that and that that's the intention of this. And we want to lighten our tool belts. I think we all have so much tech over our heads and so many management systems and so many documentation styles. Our goal was the opposite. How can we reduce all that to the bare minimum and still have everything we need, right? And it's kind of distilled into this. Yes. Um, so I guess since you just said um, trying to reduce it to a minimum, like my, I was wondering how do you, because like in your flow diagram, it's just assuming everything works, like everything. Like, yeah, it's a happy you path. Have, you have yeah. a validation app, right? So then yeah. Like how do you store the invalid path? Yeah, so, there, so there's two ways. So if it's something like silly, like a uh, wrong password, we usually just put that in line, like, oh, I just pretend I'm typing in the wrong password, show the error message, and then type in the right password, and then do the thing. That's a pretty good spec of how that is. In a giant system I was talking about, that's an, like if something goes wrong in a trading system, there's no undo button for the market. It enters into a whole new workflow when the market went against them or something happened. You have to unroll these things and minimize your risk back out of all those trades. We draw a line out of the happy path into like the unhappy world, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then there's the third one, which is uh, just like va variance, like data variance. It doesn't vary the flow, but it is data variance. And a good example of that is like discounts on an invoice and things like that. Like if you have X amount of dollars, you might get a 10% discount or you type in a discount code, then you get, this is the total. So like you want like this matrix of like all the things that could happen and how it affects what the invoice looks like. That's, ex that's kind of explained below and we kind of draw a line to that. It's like, okay, here's your invoice part on the workflow, but here's like 12 scenarios of like different things happening beforehand and how that affects that. And that's a really good spec for a person to like go in and implement that. Like you've kind of spelled it out for them, right? Here's all the things we can kind of take care of, but it doesn't require you to ruin the nice explanation part at the top. It's still something you can kind of understand fairly quickly. And it's not, I don't want it to be like 12 times as long because I have, 12 variations of data in my invoice, right? It wouldn't make sense. So I just put it on a different part. Does that explain it well? Yeah. yeah. Anything else from anyone? Because I think we're kind of five minutes till the very end of the day. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, using timestamps and what data was acquired at what points in time to uh, kind of um, like break conflicts between multiple models. Um, so in your experience, what is the additional complexity complexity of doing that across a large system and do you think like what are some situations or hallmarks of that working out as the extra effort being worth it versus not worth it? Oh, well at, at this point after almost well since I've been doing this since 2008 anything else is more complex than this for me because I'm just so used to data comes in I just write it down and everything else is just this functional left fold uh, but I think the truth is somewhere in the middle where people are just too used to having forms over data where you do have deletes and updates for your rows and you do have high coupling with different screens looking at the same thing. And now if I'm changing this screen, I have to change something here, I'm stepping on your toes because you're doing something with this screen, right? That to me is the crux of it. But I think where you're, I see where you're going, coming from is because for a simple 
systems. That may not happen until much later. So is this change of way of working too complex? Um, and it's, it's just, um, uh, what's the word for it? There's a, there's a word for it. It's a baby duck syndrome. It's like, it's just a lack of experience in working in a different way. But what I think has happened in the industry is that um, it goes back to Moore's law. Uh, Moore's law didn't happen for storage. So there was this whole like drive to have everything in, in a denormalized way. Like I said, just one user table and like just join to when you need that data about a user. But that actually couples things and it actually makes it hard to keep track of like when data entered. Because if you have a screen that adds new data and has some of that as user data, then you now need a history table associated with that user table. And now you have to mark which parts were changed and you have to do the same thing for the other information that same form. See how it actually is more complex? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you put time into the fact, like it's, it gets pretty hairy. So this, this idea that you're just going to say, I can't delete anything, I'm just going to write data down. I'm going to push all that other logic I was going to do into something that's going to be a left fold and projection. Because what you'll find is in the end you're doing the same work, you're just organizing it better. So you, in, in effect, if you are using a single model, you're cramming in multiple models later by having fancy SQL queries anyway. So you're still dealing with multiple models, but they're way harder to achieve from something that you consider a canonical model. And goes back to the storage, the, the, the disk space problem. Yeah. Right. And, and why we have, we have a lot of tooling that's incredibly good at covering up that issue, because we were forced to deal with that for decades. So there's really good SQL um, databases. There's very good SQL languages and, and ways to deal with a first normal form uh, state. But that doesn't mean it's the best. It's what we had to deal with. And the fact that the tooling is incredibly mature, you know, doesn't make it okay to continue using something that's suboptimal. And so we've entirely switched to this. And like for, if I'm starting a brand new project, this is way faster. All I do when I have my first screen and I hit save, I write down what was on that screen after passing some validation. And I, I defer any kind of projections of any of those kind of recordings to what's needed on the screen for later. I've seen that it makes no difference in terms of, in fact, it's a lot faster for us. Like we just, like no one wants to quit once we did this. It's a, it's a red pill. Like people don't want to work any other way because they like that constant um, cost curve. Adding more screens, you can see that you can, like if I zoom out, out of this, if I was to add more features, oh, come on, zoom, zoom, zoom. Ah. If I was to add any more features, I have to kind of, at the time, see what I'm going to need. I'm really on top of things like data migration and all that right, at, right when I introduce it. So that keeps that cost of introducing things quite low. In fact, I can be very conscious about it. If I try to int introduce one piece of functionality as one workflow step that all of a sudden requires everything else to be changed, I'll think twice about it. But guess what happens with regular projects? They just throw that in as a regular feature. They don't do the work to see just how much of an impact that is. You might do some story sizing or t-shirt sizing, but it's really hand wavy and really doesn't take this information um, accounting uh, into, into the picture. So, I mean, there, there's exceptions to the rule, but most places I see, it's just shoved into typical kind of uh, backlog management instead of an actual accounting of where the, what information is affected and how it's gonna affect the whole system. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if, you're tr if you're changing the way you're doing anything, start typing on Dvorak keyboard. Like, it's going to be worse at first, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's yeah. Just, yeah uh, convincing for the buy-in, right? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's like anything. Um, and, but people are, uh, so what's driving more people to be open to this? First of all, um, if you do this and you have lossless information systems, you're going to have better AI, for, like even internal private AI, just to have, like, how, how do we manage information? You're going to have way better. Um, you're going to have way better models um, that you're going to be able to train from systems like this than the traditional ones that are lossy, right? There's uh, there's just like just not even with AI, just just doing um, data analytics, having the breadcrumb trail of like why did that person take those things out of their basket? Like that's actually good marketing information. Like why is that person taking those out? Because they found that it's bundled in with this other product, right? For Amazon, that's kind of critical, and also because that information. 
may be useful for a feature you don't know you know yet. Like your, your customers might ask, might ask for a feature that's like, oh great, I actually do know what their old address was for insurance, for example. So I don't have to ask them how long they've been at their address. I actually have that information already. I have to develop extra screens to prompt them for this kind of stuff. So like some information you chuck might be like, oh, I wish I had that. Like, horrible. You don't have to anticipate. Yeah, exactly. It's, this, it's like I can always rewind to any point in time and like know exactly what anyone saw on any screen, no matter who they were. Right? And that's, it's actually reduced our, like we've never had a bug that's been longer than like four hours to fix, the redeploy the, the patch, because everything's got a breadcrumb trail. Like I'd throw away all unit tests if I had all the events stored for a system that was running. It's just been a gold mine for when you're in trouble. You, you know exactly what the state was at any point in time. It's, it's gold. It's like debugging info, but for your entire business. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, databases work like this underneath, right? They, they log ship between replicas and all that. They, they have to, right? So why not use the same thing? It's already proven, right? Yeah. Okay, um, I, I think I have to let you go legally now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, look me up. Um, yeah, thank you.